Thanks for changing all our lives. The significance of performing at the Apollo Theater honoring Hazel Scott is tremendous. Um, as an African American woman and artist, Hazel Scott was a hero to me coming up because when I looked at her, I could identify with her as an artist, I can identify with her as a woman, and I could also identify with her as an African American. Well, this year would be Hazel's 101st birthday. Um, so we're still considering this her centennial celebration. I can't think of a more perfect spot to start, to kick off the celebration, than the place where she started, where her mother played with her band. Um, she grew up just a few blocks from here on 118th Street off of Lenox Avenue. So it's apropos. Being at the Apollo Theater to celebrate such a luminary figure in music and in the artistic pantheon of black creativity at the Apollo is absolutely amazing. Hazel Scott was an amazing musician. She cut across lines. She pushed her way out of boxes. And being here on the 101st celebration of her artistry, her life, everything that she represented is extremely significant. Hazel Scott was a shiro.
In the winter of 1939, as New York's most famous poets and intellectuals, artists and celebrities descended upon Cafe Society, the city's first integrated nightclub, a 19-year-old relative unknown prepared for her debut. Hire Hazel Scott, Billie Holiday commanded of club owner Barney Josephson. When he asked, who's Hazel Scott? She replied simply, just hire her. Josephson decided to take a chance. She moved toward the piano with the grace and sophistication of a performer well beyond her years. She made good use of her full round shoulders and ample bosom, revealing luscious brown skin against a white satin strapless gown, a look that would later become her signature. There were fresh gardenias in her hair, an homage to Lady Day, and diamonds, a precious plenty, to add extra sparkle at the wrist and decolletage. The crowd had come prepared to hear Ida Cox's Wild Women Don't Have the Blues. What they got instead was a set that began with compositions by Bach, Liszt, and Rachmaninoff. Still, they indulged the young beauty if for no other reason than their curiosity had been aroused. Hazel played the classics with abandon, her expert hands racing across the keys. Then in mid-measure, she added bass notes on the first and third beats while steadily increasing the tempo, playing the original melody while introducing another until finally each piece was transformed into something highly syncopated and swinging. The shift was stunning. Over wild applause, she continued weaving improvisations and casting her fetching smile to soften the sheer shock of it all. It was her voice that I discovered first, not from a song she recorded or a performance in a Hollywood film, but from her candid opinions on various subjects, from jazz to democracy, motherhood to civil rights, all in the faded print of vintage ebony magazines. Intrigued by the outspoken pianist who confessed, I've been brash all my life, and it's gotten me into a lot of trouble. But at the same time, speaking out has sustained me and given meaning to my life. It compelled me to explore further. What I found was a woman of remarkable gifts a Juilliard-trained classical pianist who had taken New York by storm back when swing was king, becoming a breakout success in the male-dominated world of jazz. A child prodigy, she soon rose to international stardom. She was the first black entertainer to host her own television show and one of the first to refuse to perform before segregated audiences. She negotiated lucrative contracts with Hollywood studios, becoming one of the highest paid performers of her era. Above all else, she was a black woman during a time of pervasive racism who refused to accept the status quo. Although she had grown up thinking of some of the biggest names in jazz as family, Art Tatum, Fats Waller, Billie Holiday, and Lester Young, until very recently, her own name has been almost entirely lost in time. Hazel's marriage in 1945 to Harlem minister and civil rights crusading congressman Adam Clayton Powell Jr. made them one of America's most high profile black couples. Their extravagant lifestyle kept them constantly in the national press, as did her defiant stand for the House Un-American Activities Committee during the McCarthy era. So I wondered, how could a person over the years lose her place in history? I learned that Hazel Scott was a complex personality, intellectually curious and full of contradictions, the same woman who appeared on stage in sexy form-fitting gowns would go home put on a cardigan and knee socks and pick up her knitting needles, or spend hours reading in one of the seven languages she spoke. 
She took her formal classical training, fused it with her love for jazz and blues, and spent the peak years of her career swinging the classics. An act some believed undermined her real talent. And while she never set out to wear the activist tag, as she called it, for a proud Trinidadian American infuriated with all forms of injustice, taking a stand was more a natural compulsion than a premeditated intention. Here then is a musical tribute, a continuum towards the long overdue unearthing of Hazel Scott's legacy, the narrative of a life lived fully, bravely, and always on her own terms. Uptown, Hazel and her mother Alma made Harlem their home. After years of scrimping and saving, they purchased a brownstone at 79 West 118th Street near Lenox Avenue. Alma, a fine classical pianist in her own right, worked feverishly to make their monthly mortgage payments, cooking, cleaning, tailoring, until eventually teaching herself the saxophone an act that culminated in the formation of her own all-girl band, the American Creolians. Their brownstone became a regular hangout for jazz musicians. It wasn't uncommon to see and hear Alma and family friend Lester Young taking turns on tenor sax while Billie Holiday cozied up on the couch and hummed along. And when the late great pianist Art Tatum happened by, Alma greeted him with some home-cooked meals and a few cans of Pap's Blue Ribbon beer. Hazel learned her style of swing at the hands of the master. From the start, he and Hazel were like father and daughter. She called him Papa Dad. It was a connection that would last throughout their lives. Tatum liked what he heard in Hazel's play. At 18, her sound was polished, her presentation confident, the hand speed and dexterity she had developed from her classical training at the Juilliard School facilitated her quick grasp of the technical aspects of stride. Tatum encouraged Hazel to follow her natural inclination to experiment with contrapuntal forms, creating harmony among several contrasting melodic lines. Because her musical interest was now leaning toward popular music, Tatum advised her to concentrate on the blues. 
to get a true understanding of its structure, the soul and feeling of the music, telling her it would give her playing greater color and texture. In March of 1938, he gave her the ultimate nod of approval when he asked her to take over his post at the famous Door Jazz Club on 52nd Street. Papa Daddy was very kind, she said. He was more than kind, he was devastating. He taught her his innovative arrangement of Vincent Yeoman's T for Two, full of flatted fifths and ninths, gorgeous arpeggios, and a percussive left hand. Once word spread that the great Art Tatum was spending a lot of time at the Scots, next thing they knew, Fans and neighbors and fellow musicians were hanging around outside, hoping to catch a glimpse, or even better, to hear them play. Picture me upon your knee, just T for two and two for T. Just me for you and you for me alone. to see us or hear us no friends or relations on weekend vacations we won't have it known dear that we own a telephone dear day will break and you'll awake and start to bake a sugar cake for you to take for all the boys to see been a very strong feminine creature, Hazel said, and to subdue me, a very, very strong masculine creature is required. Adam Clayton Powell Jr. was just such a creature. The prominent minister of the Abyssinian Baptist Church and a frequent stalker of Manhattan nightlife, Powell was a regular at Cafe Society especially if Hazel was headlining. Cafe Society was the supper club of New York and Hazel Scott was its grand vidette, Adam said. At the end of the long room was the black concert grand piano sticking its nose up out of the audience. All the lights would go out. Hazel would make her way to the piano and suddenly a spotlight would catch her. For a moment, the audience would gasp because it looked as if she were seated there nude. The height of the piano, the bare-shouldered dress, nothing but the golden brown shoulders and arms, the super-talented fingers. 
Hazel was quite aware of Adam Powell as well. She had seen the city councilman in action up in Harlem and had shared a podium with him at war rallies in the early 1940s. As they lent their voices in support of black troops heading overseas, Hazel found herself hanging on Powell's every word. With chart-topping success on the signature and DECA labels, and as one of the highest paid entertainers of her era, the only thing Hazel was missing was love. The first time I heard Adam Clayton Powell exhort a crowd, I tingled from head to toe and realized that I was in the presence of greatness, she said. But it really started to happen for me when I heard him speak and saw the brilliance, the soul of the man. Adam was tall and bombastic, she said. But I was used to handsome, imposing men in my profession. That's part of the equipment and was no big deal. Intrigued, Hazel was flattered by Adam's pursuit. She found herself anxiously awaiting his next move, choosing to ignore the fact that he was a married man. The pair began seeing each other in secret. Our courtship was compounded of visits to cafe society, dinners at Rubens, luncheons at 21, liberal quantities of floral perfume, and hours of intense discussion of such varied topics as philosophy, politics, boogie-woogie, and war, Adam said. I had heard he was quite a playboy, and I didn't think he was marriage material, Hazel admitted. Basically, I'm a cynic and too honest. I don't expect more than a person can deliver, and I told him so. He said, we're new. Give us time. Then one wintry night in December, Adam made the statement, I'm going to marry that girl. But first, I'm going to Congress. No one is ever going to call me Mr. Hazel Scott. Following his divorce from Isabel Washington Powell, Hazel and Adam married in August of 1945. Their reception at Cafe Society was the talk of the town, and soon they would be too.
politically, the Powells were on one accord. Hazel's commitment to civil rights causes made her husband proud. Why would anyone come to hear me, a Negro, and refuse to sit beside someone just like me? Hazel would say, known for having it written in all of her contracts that she would not play before segregated audiences. Hazel stood her ground throughout her career, taking on studio bosses in Hollywood by insisting on salaries commensurate with her talent and experience, refusing to play maids or servants, even refusing any costumes that might attempt to portray her as subservient her own gowns and jewels would do, and always insisting on being credited in any film, Hazel Scott as herself. Hazel believed wholeheartedly in her husband's political pursuits and had long admired his work in the Harlem community. After the gossip and scandal surrounding their courtship died down, when it was no longer considered an indelicate subject, Hazel stated publicly in a feature in Ebony Magazine, we can do great things for our people together. Following the birth of their son, Adam Powell III, in July of 1946, they settled comfortably into family life in upstate New York, a summer house in the Hamptons, along with a luxury boat for sailing. They trotted the globe together, while Hazel played major concert halls across Europe, Adam visited the American troops to survey the condition of black soldiers abroad. It was good while it lasted. It was great while it lasted. Their bliss became blighted by the times, however. The McCarthy era, a time when ordinary citizens, artists, and activists were surveilled, watched, hunted down by the government, accused of being subversives, communists, working against the interests of the United States. Or as the late great actor Ozzie Davis once commented, we didn't know we were being targeted because we were black or red. Hazel's outspoken advocacy of civil rights issues made her an easy mark for the House Un-American Activities Committee. When her name appeared on the blacklist, she had just made television history. The Hazel Scott Show premiered on the Dumont Network to rave reviews in July of 1950. But by September, she found herself sitting before the men of HUAC defending her good name. Though she was the one to insist on a face-to-face -face showdown, her plan backfired. Her engagements were quickly canceled her reputation in ruins, and by then, even her once blissful marriage was showing signs of strain. It was then that Paris beckoned.
the falling leaves drift by the window the autumn leaves of red and gold I see Summer kisses, the sun burned hands I used to hold since you went away. The days grow. Soon I hear old winter song, but I miss you most of all, my darling. When all to me. A reinvention was in order. Hazel found peace in Paris. With her young son, Adam III, in tow, she joined the black expatriate community of artists and scholars, entertained Basie's orchestra when the fellas passed through. Billie Holiday spent weeks upon end at her flat in between gigs, as did Lester Young. James Baldwin and Dizzy Gillespie were regulars, stopping by for some of her fantastic cuisine, good conversation, and always over a few bottles of fine wine. And when they couldn't catch up in person, she and dear friend, the great pianist Mary Lou Williams, kept a steady chain of letters flowing between them, filled with all the girlfriend gossip imaginable, the sharing of artistic dreams and personal regrets, family, men, marriage, and always music. Those letters for Hazel became a form of prayer and confession, 
she would begin each one with an endearing salutation, darling, or dear sister, or dearest Mary. And she signed them all, love always, your sister Hazel. Her friend and former record producer, Leonard Feather, observed, not surprisingly, the ambiance of France in the 50s was just her bag. When she wasn't playing or listening to jazz what, studying cooking at the Cordon Bleu, or working as an actress, she could often be found entertaining lavishly in her apartment, which rapidly took on the aura of a salon. Of her life abroad, Hazel Wax poetic, my Paris is like the very first time you realize you're in love, like the very first time you're kissed. She expressed this sentiment musically with several recordings on the Polydor label that reflect the artist perhaps at her most content. Paris did indeed mark new beginnings, but also some very poignant endings. On July 17, 1959, the same day of her son's 13th birthday, Billie Holiday passed away at just 44 years old. Hazel remembered her friend this way. I remember her one night toward the end, singing a bitter blues trying to say everything, trying to explain everything within the confines of 12 bars. She had been robbed again, and she was blue. Sitting there in the Mars Club in Paris, listening to this woman who represents 
not represented so many years of my life sitting there remembering how she used to protect me and curse me and run me home when I was 15 and working on 52nd Street in New York. I was overcome by all the tragedy, all the greatness, and all the beauty of her life. With such a kaleidoscopic life, that's what she called it, Hazel's music took on a different timbre no more swinging the classics, no more commercial hits. And yet, when two young lions who had taken the jazz world by storm, Max Roach and Charles Mingus, approached her to do a collaboration on their debut label, it was the culmination of many years of yearning to stretch beyond expectations. Relaxed piano moods would become Hazel Scott's seminal recording and she would create an entirely new repertoire of straight-ahead jazz, ballads, and torch songs. The only tune that remained from her earlier period was Art Tatum's Tea for Two, and she'd often slip in a few bars of Debussy's Claire de Lune for good measure. Had she lived beyond her 61 years? It's easy to imagine that she would have pursued some of her lifelong dreams to write sacred music, an opera, a jazz suite, a film score. A renegade, Hazel Scott achieved many firsts, but found it hard to resist the challenge of exploring every aspect of her creative self. In one of her final interviews, when asked what was the most important thing to her as an artist, Hazel simply replied, the important part, when I have been able to transmit that which I have been singularly gifted with, to move an audience to their feet.
My life's a wreck, a wreck you're making oh, You know I'm yours just for the taking I gladly surrender my soul to you I Karen Chilton, how did we get here? What was the process like discovering Hazel Scott's life and writing her story? What was that like? How did we get here? Wow, okay, so we gotta go back over 10 years ago. Oh, actually longer than that. Um, the book, the biography was actually published 10 years ago. So we have to add seven years to that because um, I discovered her when I was interested in writing a book about black women artists, expatriates. And I didn't know who she was. And growing up in Chicago, I was so accustomed to listening to jazz and blues. I mean, that was the music I loved growing up. So I thought I knew every jazz artist there was to know. And when I started doing research for this expatriate book, um, I was looking at Nina Simone and Barbara Chase Raboud and, you know, painters, sculptors, um, opera singers, Barbara Hendricks and Grace Bumbry. And, you know, I had this whole long list of women, Lois Maylou Jones. And I mean, I, I, there were so many women. And as I was researching someone else, I don't even remember, I don't even remember now who it was, but I was just in the New York Public Library going through all this material and I saw her picture. I saw her face first, and I said, who is this woman? It was this gorgeous, gorgeous picture, and it said jazz artist, jazz pianist. I was like, wait a minute, how is she jazz, and I don't know who she is. So I, it just, it was one of those kismet kind of things. It was serendipitous where it just pulled me in. Her story pulled me in, and I thought, oh, Hazel Scott, I want to know more about her. So I remember calling my father and saying, have you ever heard of this woman, Hazel Scott? And um, he said, yeah, I remember her. He said, she was like your grandfather's heir and she used to have a TV show. I'm like, what? She had a TV show. So then that sent me down the rabbit hole. Next thing I know, I forgot all about the expatriates books with all this, you know, all these fabulous women. And I just got hung up on her story. It was the not knowing that got me. It was that curiosity was sparked and I started digging and digging and I realized there's no, I mean, the first thing I went to is, oh, there must be a book about her. And there was no book. Mm -hmm. So then I kept a folder and I would find, you know, clippings from the New York Times and 
all of these materials I would just kind of file away and then it got fatter and fatter and fatter. And I said, you know what, I'm writing this book. I'm writing this book. You know, it was just like an insane moment. Like, I don't know, I, I'm gonna write this book. I had already written Gloria Lynn's book, another great Harlemite. We had collaborated on her memoir. So that was maybe two years after that book was published that I sort of got the, the inkling to do another book. And, um, and it, then after that, it just, everything opened up. I contacted her son, Adam Powell, in Virginia and said, hey, I wanna write a book about your mother. And he was like, okay. So um, I actually didn't know just how huge the story was. I, you know, it was the kind of thing where you jump in and you don't know how deep the water is, but then you gotta swim, <laughs> you gotta figure it out. So that's what happened. So it ended up being about five years, five solid years of research. And at the same time, I was also looking for a publisher and everybody said no. I mean, name a publisher. They all said no. Everybody said, all. I, I was turned down by some of the best of the best. Um, people were interested in her story, but they just thought, well, black woman in jazz, who buys those books? And I just thought, but this woman's story is fascinating. You know, isn't writing and publishing about great stories? So I just kept going. And then 2009, University of Michigan Press, they said yes. And that was after maybe 50 publishers. And they said yes, like in 10 minutes. They're like, yeah, this makes sense, let's do it. You know, so seven years of waiting, I was like, oh, you wanna do it? So um, then it was two additional years of writing, interviewing, researching. So that was about a seven year process. Book came out 2009. Fast forward, her centennial was last June. We're celebrating now because of COVID. And here we are. So my question for you, I wanted, I was always really, really interested in talking to musicians when I was working on her book. And that was one of my, not a regret, but it was one of the things that I wished I could have had more of. So many of her um, fellow musicians, the people that she was really close to, Duke Ellington, Dizzy Gillespie, Lena Horne, all of them were gone. So I was really scrambling to get the perspective of other musicians and what they thought of her musicianship about her style, her playing, and particularly pianist. So I would love to know what you think of her as a pianist, her style, her musicianship. Go. <laughs> Hazel Scott pushed the envelope. She had an amazing uh, facility at the instrument, at the piano. She could sing. She was stunningly, gorgeously beautiful. Uh, she was an actress. But her piano playing is something that I don't think really is discussed and uh, talked about uh, the way that people talk about other musicians. To this day, I don't know a musician. I didn't say a woman. I didn't say a female musician. I said a musician that had the level of technique that she possessed, her dexterity, her speed, her velocity, on the instrument, there's a video clip of her playing two pianos, sort of apex uh, from each other, the keyboards, and she's able to play, which means there's something going on in the brain. The synaptic gaps are firing in such a way that she can think forward and backwards with each side, each hemisphere, the right hemisphere of the brain and the left hemisphere. She's definitely a genius. She's definitely uh, a wunderkind. She is a monogene. I've never uh, seen or witnessed in my life someone that had the ability to uh, move effortlessly around the instrument, the piano. And also in her brain, she was a composer to me because she was constantly improvising, arranging, understanding the compositional structure of the classical music, uh, which was much a part of her expression. And at the same time, the blues and jazz music, American music, popular music, she was able to execute anything at any time that she wanted to, in the moment, with spontaneity. Uh, her brand was that, as she was like uh, uh, a diamond, a beautiful diamond, where every time you turn the jewel, turn the stone, you see another uh, facet of beauty, just like a kaleidoscope. I mean, on the piano, her left hand was even. Uh, her ability to uh, 
play bravura as if she was playing a concerto uh, to create cadenzas uh, on the spot and stay in the pocket. Her, her sense of rhythm, her, uh, her ability to be the accompanist, to comp on the piano, her ability to lead in solo, and her ability to uh, keep the meter. I mean, I could go on and on about her musicianship. So we're here at the Apollo Theater, mm -hmm. just coming out of Black History Month, February. We are now in Women's History Month. You as a female creator, I'd like to deal with something a little uh, more specific. Mm -hmm. Hazel Scott was a brilliant woman. Can you talk a little bit about what it feels like being a black indigenous person of color, an African-American black woman today in society, and the juxtaposition of Hazel Scott's interaction with people like the great James Baldwin, mm. uh, with uh, people like Quincy Jones. Mm -hmm. And for you as a creator, do you feel that the environment amongst creators from the African and African-American diaspora has the same connectivity and fluidity of sharing that it did as you found in your research with Hazel Scott? I think it does. I would say that we as creatives are in a kind of a continuum. Um, your question brings to mind a quote that Hazel had in her, part of my research was I had access to all her diaries that her son let me use. So in the book, there's a lot of her writing. Um, I wanted her voice to be very present in the biography. Um, and there was a quote that she had that said something like, none of us are responsible for our gifts, only for what we do with them. Mm. And I feel that she felt it as a child prodigy. She felt the weight of bring, being a prodigy and being sort of a genius child. And I think that as artists, and I hope this is answering your question, I think as artists, I feel a certain kind of responsibility for all that I'm able to do and the, and the talents that I've been gifted with. Um, sometimes I spread myself too thin, but what happens with me, I'm an actor and a writer, um, I'm also a playwright. I, you know, <laughs> you, know you and I right. have collaborated on on a, on a million projects. So, but but I always say actor writer because everything that I do, those are extensions of the same thing. They're extensions of that person that goes and puts words on page, and that person that stands upon the stage and can perform a text. So I think that yes, I think the answer I would say is yes. I think that we are a continuum, we are continuing in the tradition of Hazel, of James Baldwin, well, I hope. I think that we, we have um, broad shoulders to stand on. I think it's far easier for us to do what we do than it ever was for them. I mean, she came up in the 30s and the 40s. I mean, this was the Jim Crow era. She had to write into her contracts, I won't play before segregated audiences. And we, we have no concept of what that is. So I think, yes, I think that our responsibility is tremendous. I think that in pursuing excellence in our craft, we honor them. We honor the legacy of those that paid such a heavy price to do what we do with a lot more freedom than they ever had. So, one more question for you, Damien, and this is a short one. Before we started this event for the Apollo, I sent you tons of Hazel Scott music and clips and listened to this and listened to that, and we spent time listening to a lot of her music. Was there any one song in particular or any one performance in particular where you just sort of stood back and just said, this woman was awesome? Wow. Uh, for me, I'd have to say each video, each audio excerpt continued to force me to say I need to know more about this woman. Sometimes with certain artists, there's one song that is my favorite. Other artists, like a Jesse Norman, everything I listen to, I just crave more and more. And the only thing I wish for 
if there had been more of Hazel Scott's recordings, if she could have been alive at a time where capturing and recording her artistry, her, her excellence was more commonplace. You know, um, I just want more and more and I wish I could have talked to her and discovered how she could be so resilient at a time when it was difficult to do different things. You know, people like to keep you in a box. You talked about being an actor and being a writer and being a librettist. Hazel Scott could do anything. And when I listen to her musical recordings, I just want more and more. Well, I have to say thank you. I get to say thank you to you <laughs> for sharing you. this wonderful centennial celebration with me and Camille Thurman as well. Yes, I think brilliant musician and singer. Thank brilliant. you for bringing Hazel Scott's story and her life to the world. Thank you for that. Picture me upon your knee, just T for two and two for T. Just me for you and you for me alone. Nobody near us to see us or hear us. No friends or relations on weekend vacations. We won't have it known, dear, that we own a talent.